Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. Glad to have you with us. School sports are underway, and that means there's an increased risk for sports-related injuries, such as head trauma, especially with young football players. An alarming new study revealed that football players who have repeated head trauma could be at risk for a neurodegenerative brain disease called CTE. We've come to the urgency room in Vanus Heights for some answers about CTE, and joining us is Dr. Susie Hoffman. Thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thanks so for coming. What exactly is CTE, and um, what did that study reveal? CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is a degenerative brain disorder seen in people who sustain multiple blows to the head, such as athletes. The study you're referring to diagnosed CTE in over 90% of the ex-NFL players whose brains were studied after they died. And these were people that probably might have suspected that they had this and their brains, the families donated their brains then. Right. So there could be a reason why there was a high level, a level of it among them as well. Sure, there definitely could be some biases in that study, but it's still alarming. But then there's some indication that even like high school um, football players and college football players may also be at risk for this as well as the NFL. Absolutely, anybody who sustains multiple blows to the head, unfortunately, may be at risk for CTE. And when you say multiple um, blows, when, are we talking always concussion or just a trauma of getting hit? And right, we're not always talking concussion. We're, we're talking about less than concussion oftentimes, really? or what we call sub-concussive. So even just minor, normal seeming plays during a routine football game may be putting your athlete at risk. Wow, that's really frightening. I know um, I had one young mom tell me that after she heard about this study, she goes, I'm gonna have to really think about having my young son play football, maybe even hockey and things like that. Should they be alarmed? The results of the study certainly are concerning and we all should take note. I know I don't blame parents if they want to keep their kids out of these sports because we don't really know what the risks are. This is a newer disease process that has just been encountered. And I mentioned football players, but they're not unique. I mean, it can happen to any anyone who gets repeated brain tra right. head trauma. Right. So, hockey, soccer, even basketball, baseball, of course, wrestling, boxing, rugby. Wow, I don't even think about some of those. That when you're thinking about right. head trauma. So um, is there any way of diagnosing this? You said you were looking at um, brains that have been donated. Right now, the only definitive way to diagnose CTE is to directly examine someone's brain after death. So what can parents, what can athletes do to perhaps diminish their risk of getting this brain disease? So always ensure that your athlete has the proper equipment that they need for their sport. Make sure that equipment is well maintained, it's fitting properly, and by all means, if your child sustains a head injury, take it very seriously. It seems like too that the schools have gone, come on board with that as well, and coaches, and that they're more aware of these risks and things like that. That um, I think if they sustain a concussion, ha they have to sit out for so long. What other things should they be doing if they incur a head trauma? If your child sustains a head injury, you should have your child examined by a medical professional. If you're unable to get into your primary clinic, come see us at the urgency room. We're open 365 days a year, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. And if your child is diagnosed with a concussion, by all means, do not let them return to play until all their concussion symptoms have resolved and they've been cleared by their primary medical provider. What would be some of those um, signs that the concussion hasn't cleared yet? So continued headaches, dizziness, trouble with focus or attention, change in moods, trouble sleeping, all those types of symptoms are pretty common with a concussion. So, and we mentioned some of the other sports and things like that. Any other advice that you would give to parents and young athletes out there? Yeah, just take it easy. Don't rush back to your sport. I know you want to get back and play that next game, but truly it's worth it to let your brain heal. If you sustain a second concussion before the first one is healed, you're at risk for much worse head injury and it may take a lot longer to clear. 
And as far as um, when they come into a facility like the urgency room, um, they may get a scan, but scans don't always show a concussion. What is, what is, why have a scan and what, how do you diagnose a concussion then? Yeah, you're exactly right. So a concussion is generally diagnosed based on the history of head trauma and a thorough physical examination. What we're looking for is if there's an injury more severe than a concussion. So if we're concerned that there could be a skull fracture or bleeding in the brain, then we would do a test like a CT scan, but it's not always needed to diagnose a concussion. Because it just doesn't show up on right, they don't show what up. we have today. Maybe in the future, maybe, perhaps. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, other final comments for our viewers about um, this study, what they should know about it, and, and what they can do to protect their young their loved ones? You know, just be vigilant. Make sure that your child is telling you if they sustain an injury, don't let them try to downplay it. Ask your medical provider if you have further questions. So we're, we're talking inside the urgency room at the Bandit Heights, but you have a couple other locations as well. Yes, we do. We have a location at Egan and also a location in Woodbury. So don't hesitate if any question, just bring them in and have them looked at by Absolutely. an emergency physician like Absolutely. We would yourself. be happy to take a look at them. So Dr. Hoffman, thank you for being with us. We appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thanks for coming out. Thanks. September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, a time to reach out to those affected by suicide, to raise awareness and to help individuals at risk get the help that they need. A new Twin Cities mental health anti-stigma campaign called Our Hopes is helping raise awareness so no one is alone on their mental health journey. judge you by your your illness that they think that defines you a lot of people back off when they find out you have a mental illness they think they might have done criminal activities well I think stigma comes about because of uh, ignorance I always have stigma as somebody oh that girl I don't want to be near her like, they, they, they judge it's judgment Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home when we talk about mental illness people get nervous and we want we will giggle we'll make jokes about it but we don't engage with the topic in a serious way it makes you feel embarrassed you're ashamed they belittle you and it's just an uneasy, unhappy situation. When somebody knows that you have one, they seem to center on what you can't do rather than what you can do. Many people think that when somebody says they are mentally ill, um, they take a step back and think that you're a bad person. And it is. I, was, I always had hurt feelings. My feelings were always hurt. People with mental illness are just as normal as anybody else. They just have to deal with something, you know, in their lives. I've been able to work the last 27 years by staying on my medication. The thing with African-American families is the shame. They don't want to admit sometimes that something is wrong kind of an outcast out of the family. Although family also, and then in turn, family is very helpful. Family is very important to Native American. 
I think it's wrong to stigmatize people that have mental illness. There are a whole, whole host of attitudes and values we will push onto that person. They, we may assume they're dangerous or that they're on drugs or that they're, they're not smart. Uh, there are all sorts of things, that, values that we put on folks who live with mental illness that I don't think are fair. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. He said, what's going on with you today? And I said, well, I'm just having a rough day. I, um, he said, why? And I said, well, I have schizophrenia, and I, I'm just really struggling today. And he said, um, he said, well, I thought people with schizophrenia went to schoolyards and shot up the schoolyard. And I just couldn't believe he had said that. It just really hurt. It's not our fault that we are mentally ill. Something can be done for it. We can take medications, for example. We are not bad people. It's challenging for anybody, but it's really challenging when you're raising children. And I raised two boys. I kind of put them through the ringer with this. People uh, are kind and patient, and uh, it's a community, and that that's something we need more of, not less of. Places where people feel like they belong and their voices matter. But I think being able to enter into a dialogue as a community and talk about really, you know, what, what is mental illness? I mean, when one out of every four of us has it, it's really a deception to think that it's something other, and that it's not us. And the reality is it's, it is us. The thing that I love about my music and what it does for people is that I can play it and because it's instrumental, it can speak to people in whatever mood they're in. So I can play my music and people can have different stories and different reactions and different memories. I guess would be nice. You need to know the person first. It's just, it's a disease and it's manageable. Just give us a chance. Well, right now I work with homeless youth and probably a good chunk of that percentage have mental illness and I've been able to give back. It is possible to be successful even with a mental illness that a lot of people have gone on to do great things.
name is Blake. I received a heart transplant when I was two weeks old. I play defense for the Red Hot Tornadoes. The best part about playing soccer is that I get to run around and have fun. Just because I had a heart transplant, I don't expect people to take it easy on me. I can still do anything they can do. Sometimes my heart starts pounding like faster and faster as I go. I know I have someone else's heart inside me. It makes me feel happy because someone was generous enough to give me a second chance to live. I feel like it's my responsibility to live each day to the fullest. And the thing I look forward to the most is having my own family. This gift of life was made possible by an organ donor. Imagine what you could make possible. Learn more and sign up as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Go to organdonor.gov. Get on top of it before they do. Every 24 minutes, tipped furniture or a falling TV sends an injured child to the emergency room. Preventing tip-over incidents is easy, inexpensive, and only takes five minutes. Learn how to secure your furniture and TVs to protect children at anchorit.gov. Chiru has no choice. She and millions like her must walk miles every day for dirty water. But together, we can end their walk by providing clean water close by. Instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick, girls can be in a classroom that expands their minds, and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses caused by dirty water. At World Vision, care about clean water runs deep, deep enough to reach one new person with clean water every 10 seconds. Because every child, every person, everywhere deserves clean water and a chance to rise to their full potential. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. During the fall, lots of folks still head to the Minnesota State Parks, so we've come to Afton State Park and to talk to a park ranger about um, safety tips that can help keep you and your family safe, and we're pleased to have with us park ranger Nick Barrows. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's really great. Thanks yeah, for thanks taking for time out. out. Absolutely. It's a gorgeous day right today. It is. It does get much better than that, especially this time of year. So tell us a little bit about Afton State Park. Yeah, so the park is... Uh, about 1700 acres. Um, we've got 22 miles of hiking trails in the park. We're a very popular hiking and trail running destination. Um, this big summertime draw is going to be our swimming beach. We have a sand, beautiful sand beach right on the edge of the St. Croix River. Um, we have camping in the park. There's 28 hike-in backpack sites, so a really rustic experience. And there's also group camps, camper cabins, and yurts for people to take advantage of as well. And you were telling me that the fall, it really comes alive here. It with does. With the colors our, in, the, in the trees and everything. Absolutely. Busiest time of year. Um, you know, the, the fall colors up and down the valley are really something to, it's worth making the trip to see. So. And even in the wintertime, too, this is a hot spot. It is. Yep. We do uh, cross-country skiing and snowshoeing in the winter. Um, it really offers a whole different perspective than what you see. You know, it really changes from season the season incredibly but seeing it from the summer to the winter is really a treat. So. so everyone they want to come out here have a good time but what would be some of those top 10 safety tips that you would give them so that they can have a great time when they're here? Sure so the first one that's really at the top of our mind is going to be protection from uh, tick-borne illnesses so um, being sure you're using your mosquito spray or clothing treatments keep the ticks off. There's uh, wood ticks are typically act a little bit more active earlier in the summer and the spring but deer, tuck, uh, deer ticks have been active year-round. There have been reported cases of bites even in December 
December on those years that there's low snow. So, wow, that's hard to believe. Yep, yeah. yep. So Good with, to uh, keep in mind. Absolutely. With Lyme disease, and there's a few new viruses that are just starting, they're getting documented reports of that are pretty risky. So, so yeah, you don't want to take that home with you once you leave the park yep, as well. So absolutely. make sure you check yourself after you left, leave the yep, park and thorough stuff. check and light colored clothing so they're easy to spot, tick gators, the spray, you know, it all it's, uh, it all helps to keep yourself clear. So. What about like wildlife or even vegetation? Are there things that people should be concerned about? Sure, yeah, there's always, you know, um, not really any threatening animals in the area here. We have occasional it's bear reports. Park. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> especially, um, you know, going off trail, there's poison ivy and different things like that. So being sure you're able to identify things when you're on the trail and if you have, you know, if you're unsure about it, just it's better to avoid it. So. And what about snakes or anything like that? Snakes in our area, there aren't any venomous, dangerous snakes, um, So, but it's still good to keep an eye out. We do have fox snakes in the park that actually mimic rattlesnakes, so it gives makes people a little nervous, but uh, they're you know, all, kind of all bark and no bite type of thing. So so I think the same advice if, with all the hiking trails to make sure that people have good yep. walking shoes and make sure that they're covered and things like that. Yep, sturdy footwear, staying hydrated. You know, it's been a cooler summer, so it hasn't been as much of a risk, but especially as we go into these cooler seasons, you don't notice that you're becoming dehydrated because it's cooler out, you're not uncomfortable, but that uh, dry air is just sapping the moisture from you. So bringing a water bottle of water with you is very important. Yeah, we talked with one of the urgent um, room physicians and he was saying that that is a concern of dehydration. People, they're around the water, around our lakes, our rivers, and, and they get dehydrated. Absolutely. Because they're just not making yep. enough fluids yep. or they're drinking too much alcohol too. Yeah. <laughs> that could be another. <laughs> Shouldn't be an issue in state parks. We, yeah. you know, keep it family friendly, but yeah, it's just something else that you're, when you're outside, uh, be sure you're aware of. What would be some of those common um, rules and policies that everyone should know before they come to the park? Too? Yeah, you know, the most important thing is let people know where you're going. Um, you know, have a check-in, check-out system if you're hiking alone especially. And why so is they, that? Well, so they know when to expect you. If something happens, if you roll an ankle or you get uh, turned around, they'll know that, okay, well, this person said they were going to be home at this time. They're not here yet. I need to call and, you know, send out, uh, send help for them because mm -hmm. you never know what happens. So. Yeah, sounds like great advice. Um, also, what should they bring with them to the park? I mean, what kinds of things would you advise them to have? You mentioned yeah. um, having water. Yep, bottle of water. Usually a, a basic first aid kit is nice to carry with. They make ones that are extremely compact. You can even throw it in your pocket. You got basic band-aids and things like that. Um, uh, sturdy footwear is also very important, especially at some of our trails here. They can mm -hmm. get rough, so be sure you have good footwear. Um, Comfortable uh, layered clothing is important, especially as we get into the fall season so that you can, you know, stay warm or cool off as needed. Because mm -hmm. when you're sweating, that's when you're really at risk for, for dehydrating. So. And then um, do cell phones work very well here or should you have a, also, uh, obviously there's not too many places to charge it in. Yeah, so. yeah, a charge cell phone, you know, close to the metro, most parks are going to have decent cell coverage, but it really can be spotty. So again, if you're out of contact with the phones, it's good to have that check-in, check-out system with someone that knows where you are, no one to expect you back. Any other um, safety things that someone could bring with them you think that would be good? Maybe you said extra clothing that you can, maybe blankets or things like that? Yeah, or? you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's best to kind of prepare for the worst. You know, you don't expect something to go bad, but if it does, you know, survival kits, especially in the winter, is very important. Uh, you know, food stores, things like that is, you know, good to bring with. It's not essential, but if you want to be prepared for the worst, it's, it's best to, you know, have the things with you so you can respond accordingly. And also, um, any concerns about weapons or anyone? I mean, obviously, no firearms. Yeah, but firearms aren't allowed in state parks. Um, you know, you a lot those. of people bring. You wouldn't need it. I mean, um, you know, it, it's they're they're allowed to carry with you, especially the pocket knives and okay. things like that. Something considered a weapon aren't allowed in state parks. So there's not that threat. Um, but beyond that, you know. You know, not west. We've heard a lot of um, different fires happening at a lot of the national parks and stuff and um, any concern about fires here and, and uh, just at just at the picnic areas they have to? Yeah, campfire safety, you know, if you're just doing your general campfires, um, you know, it's, especially with younger kids, it's a good, uh, good idea to keep a close, as, as close an eye as possible on them. Um, our fire rings are all to the fire codes that they've got a higher rim so there's not as much of a risk. I, I can of, tell, that, yeah, yeah, see that. Yep, yep. So, but yeah, campfire safety, it, it just takes a moment for something to go wrong, so. Yeah, we want to keep the parks looking as beautiful yeah, as they are. Yep, and we do a pretty aggressive, you know, prescribed burning program in the parks. So the wildfire risk isn't as significant, especially a year like this where we've had timely rains. But yeah, especially as we get into the fall season where it's drier, making sure that fires are completely extinguished and you have water close by, just to make sure nothing escapes for, to where it's not supposed to be. Yeah, you, you'd hate to start a fire. Yeah, or, yeah. Or 
get burnt by a fire as well. So just final advice for our viewers. It's good to bring um, you know, a survival whistle with, uh, you know, something that if your voice isn't able to carry to get a hold of someone if you're in trouble, um, those whistles can you know, be heard from up to you know, two miles away in the right types of conditions. So it's gonna make you that much more uh, likely to be found if you are lost or injured or something like that. It's also good to bring a, a flashlight with, um, you know, cause you never know if you do get turned around somewhere, if you're gonna be out beyond, be, uh, you know, later than sunset, especially as the days are getting shorter as we get into the fall season here. And I think you'd wanna also be aware of um, the weather, what kind of weather conditions could yep. develop maybe once you're here even? Absolutely, yep. In the summer, there's always a thunderstorm risk. They can really come up out of nowhere. In the winter, you know, conditions change rapidly, especially as we get into the fall. You know, you can start out your day and it's, you know, 75 degrees and sunny at noon and by five o'clock it can be 34 and sleet coming down. So. so. Be really aware of that. Yep. And uh, as um, park rangers, you're also aware of who's in the park as well. We they are. all have to check in before yep, they yep. come in. As, uh, as state park staff, we're always you know, addressing any safety issues. We're quick to respond if something gets reported to the office. So if you get into a situation where you're not comfortable, feel that your safety is going to be at, at risk, um, call the park office and we'll, we'll um, get out to help take care of it. Between us and the sheriff's office, we've got responders available. And if someone wants to get more information about the park or about park safety and stuff like that, where should they go? What would you recommend? Yep, the DNR uh, website is a, a great resource. Just go to mndnr.gov and there's a state parks page. Otherwise, uh, you can call us here at the park at 651-436-5391 uh, and be happy to answer any questions people may have. Final comments for our viewers, a recommendation or advice? Sure, I'd say, uh, you know, if you are looking for something to do this fall, it's definitely worth making the trip out to the park here. It's uh, absolutely gorgeous up and down the river valley. We've got some great overlooks and it's a great place to take in the fall colors. So we hope to see you out and hope everyone stays safe. Sounds so, great. All right. Nick Barrels, park ranger, yep. thank you for being with us. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.